Kia ora koutou katoa. Good evening, everyone. I want to start by acknowledging that Dr. Bloomfield has accompanied me for this press conference um, in order to answer any questions that may arise from uh, the statement that I am about to make and the decisions that have been made by Cabinet today. It has been 53 hours since we moved Auckland into COVID alert level three and the rest of New Zealand to level two. This afternoon, Cabinet met to receive the latest information and advice from the Ministry of Health and to discuss next steps in our resurgence response plan, a plan with the primary purpose of restoring our level one freedoms as quickly as possible. We have made a good start on that plan. This is what we know about the new infection in New Zealand. We have identified 29 cases. At this stage, all remain linked to one cluster centred in Auckland. One other case that is likely linked to the cluster is still being investigated. We have undertaken more than 30,000 tests in the last 48 hours. 38 people linked to the cluster are now in government-managed quarantine as a precautionary measure. There are signs we have found this outbreak relatively early in its life. While the first case we identified tested positive this Tuesday, extensive testing and contact tracing has since determined that the earliest case we have found to date was a worker at the Americold Cool Store in Mount Wellington who became sick on approximately the 31st of July. This may not yet be the origin of the outbreak, but on the information we have to date, it's the earliest sign of the re-emergence of the virus. In terms of the ongoing investigation to identify where the virus originated from, there is still no clear connection at this point. Contact tracing and genomic testing has not found a link to the border or managed isolation and quarantine facilities at this stage. The sequence of the virus from the current outbreak is not the same as the sequences from community cases in our first original outbreak in New Zealand. This suggests this is not a case of the virus being dormant or of a burning ember in our community. It appears to be new to New Zealand. In terms of wider surveillance, since I made the announcement to move alert levels on Tuesday, we have tested more people than in any other time we have had COVID in New Zealand. We have stock for a further 303,000 tests currently in New Zealand. The level three restrictions and the speed in which they were implemented will have made a material difference in containing the spread of this outbreak so will everyone's compliance with those restrictions. Auckland travel data yesterday, the first full day of level three, shows a 60% reduction in travel compared with the last three Thursdays, which is even less travel than at level three last time, which just demonstrates the incredible job that Aucklanders are currently doing. This is also what we know. We know the incubation period for COVID-19 and our experience of previous clusters, some of which reached more than 80 cases, means we can expect to see more cases as part of this cluster. It will grow before it slows, and it may continue to be linked to schools, churches, and social gatherings, as it has done to date. We also know, based on overseas experience and our own, that it is possible to contain a cluster or outbreak without ever being able to identify its origin. What is important is making sure that we establish the perimeter of the cluster and to stop it from growing. To do this, we do need to take into account that all important incubation period. And so, in keeping with our precautionary approach and New Zealand's philosophy of going hard and going early. 
Today, Cabinet has agreed to maintain our current settings for an additional 12 days, bringing us to a full two weeks in total. Our current expectation is that by this time, the perimeter of the cluster will be identified, will be isolated, and we can move to level two in Auckland with confidence. That means Auckland will remain at level three and New Zealand will remain at level two, the rest of the country, until 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday the 26th of August. We will, however, review these settings on the 21st of August. We want to give about a week's time to see how we are travelling before we review again. I would characterise our approach as short but precautionary hold in an ongoing investigation so that we continue to stamp out the virus. There is nothing to suggest we need to move to a level four lockdown at this stage, as we do not have a number of clusters or unrelated cases. I'll say that again because I've seen a lot of speculation. There is nothing to suggest we need to move to a level four lockdown. Cabinet also does not want Auckland to be in level three any longer than is needed to ensure the outbreak is managed. Our intention is that Auckland and New Zealand will quickly move back down through alert levels if we continue on this track, but it is wise to take a bit of extra time. That bit of extra time is our best way of getting out quickly. As always, the best economic response is a strong health response and short, and sharp is best. Lifting restrictions now and seeing a potential explosion in cases is the worst thing we could do for Auckland and the New Zealand economy. At the same time, level three does allow us to continue with more activity than a full level four lockdown, and I do think that's important to remember. Estimates are that the economy operates at roughly about 80% at level three compared to 60% at level four. I am mindful, though, of the extraordinary disruption to business and the anxiety that this outbreak will be causing. As before, we will use what tools we have to protect jobs, incomes and businesses, as well as people's health. To provide certainty to businesses and workers, I can confirm today that Cabinet has made an in-principle decision to extend the wage subsidy scheme to support businesses and protect jobs as we undertake the public health measures required to fight the virus. Finance Minister Grant Robertson will be working through the final details with officials and Minister Cipollone over the weekend. But I can say that the extension to the wage subsidy will be nationwide and will cover the period of time that the current level three restrictions remain in place. Minister Robertson is here, and once Dr. Bloomfield and I leave the podium, he will take uh, the stage to give a bit more of an explanation and answer any questions you have that on that. I want to touch very briefly on the activity that continues in Auckland under Level 3 with the appropriate health and safety protocols in place. Auckland Transport has 44 construction sites operating under Level 3. Construction continues across five sites on our largest infrastructure project, the City Rail Link, with about 1,200 workers. The Employers and Manufacturers Association has said many food service businesses that closed during Level 3 last time are this time adapting and trading on a click and collect or delivery basis. And houses continue to be built in Auckland. Kyanga Order alone has over 150 projects with over 3,000 units under construction. All of this is happening because of the protocols on operating safely at level three, which includes social distancing at work sites. If you have questions over whether your business can operate, please visit the COVID-19 website or contact MB directly. To summarize, as we have said from the start, our overall COVID-19 strategy remains elimination. That requires the ongoing stamping out of the virus any time that it comes back. Together, we have got rid of COVID before. We have kept it out for 102 days, longer than any other country. 
We have been world leading in our COVID response with the result that many lives were saved and our economy was getting going faster than almost anywhere else again. We can do all of that again. 1.5 million New Zealanders in our biggest city are carrying a heavy load for our team of 5 million right now. But together, we will overcome an obstacle that we knew had the potential to come our way, which is why we have a plan, why we are rolling out that plan, and why we once again can pull together to eliminate COVID. So here's what I ask today. If you're in Auckland, please stay at home in your bubble. Wear a face covering whenever you leave your home. For the rest of New Zealand, use a face covering in places where you're close to others, like on public transport. Download and use the app and make sure you can quickly access all your movements for the last 14 days in case you are contacted by the contact tracers. Businesses, please put up your COVID tracer QR code posters. And everyone, wash your hands, stay home if you're sick, and if you're unwell, get a test. We'll be checking in again soon, but till then, stay safe, stay kind, and stay well, everyone. We're happy to take questions. Jessica. Prime Minister, did you give consideration to an all of North Island level three, given that we've had cases now outside of Auckland? Um, no, that, that wasn't something that was viewed as necessary, nor was it something that the Director General advised Cabinet um, was necessary. Of those cases that we have in the Waikato area, they have all been connected, they've all been contact traced, they've been tested and they're in isolation. And that is part of our normal regime. We have to, of course, remember uh, Level 2 is designed to be able to coexist alongside a strong contact tracing, isolation and quarantine system. The issue is we have a larger outbreak in the city of Auckland, which is why we have a uh, high level of restrictions there. Yeah, there's a debate about whether it should go down to Level 2, given that it has been those 12 new cases today. I, I guess some people were expecting that to be bigger. Uh, well, uh, ultimately though, what we have seen is of those cases, we are contact tracing a large number of people. And they are groups of people who prior to the identification of these first cases, so before we were aware of them, had attended churches, had attended schools. And so we're very mindful of the need that whilst we have a small number of currently identified cases, that we need to identify the full perimeter of this cluster and reduce down its potential impact as much as possible. We were very keen to allow ourselves the time to review. If we find, for instance, over the next seven days uh, that the perimeter is identified, that it's well contained, we give ourselves the space to consider our settings. But ultimately, for the sake of certainty, we foresee it being no longer at this stage than an additional 12 days. Okay, so, Prime Minister, perhaps give Dr Bloomfield a chance to speak to his advice on that as well. Thank you, Prime Minister, um, and kia ora koutou. Uh, so just to um, reiterate the points the Prime Minister's made, um, our public health advice uh, is, is essentially consistent with what the decision Cabinet made, which was to extend the current settings for 12 days. Uh, the total of 14 days in uh, Alert Level 3 in Auckland and Alert Level 2 around the country is the incubation period, but more important here is we feel that will give us uh, sufficient time to have absolutely determined the extent of the current outbreak and to have um, contact traced, isolated and tested uh, to identify that and confirm that both within Auckland and any cases that there, further cases there may be outside of Auckland. So different from the uh, situation earlier, we do, there may well still be the odd case and the odd new case in 12 days time. However, the, the plan now is, and the reason we've put all the effort in to strengthening our testing and contact tracing and to adding in this, um, this uh, uh, addition of quarantining our cases to, in particular, prevent onward transmission within the households. W the reason we've boosted all that is that we can contact trace and test and isolate our way through this outbreak. Mm -hmm. The alert levels provide additional assurance here. And I just want to make one final comment again on that quarantine um, situation. Uh, one of the bits of feedback we had is in the some of the earlier clusters, we had some families part of that Marist cluster who ended up spending 46 days 
in their home environment isolated because they kept getting transmission within the family. So one of the key reasons we want to create that opportunity for a very managed quarantine um, situation for these families affected is so that they don't, that doesn't have to happen again. Mm. Prime, Minister, Prime, Minister, Prime, Prime Minister, how, thank you. how likely is it that we will never identify the source of this outbreak? And can we extrapolate from your comments that um, given it is a new strain and wasn't lying dormant, that it, it is linked to our borders? No, because you will have actually heard me say that of the genome testing that's been done to date, nothing actually does draw that link at this stage between uh, uh, the cases, the case that we have um, and those who are genome tested within our quarantine. So at the moment, there, there isn't that link there. It doesn't rule it out completely, but that is what that testing has demonstrated to date. Um, source. Yeah, and so this is, you know, we've had a number of, of theories that we've continued to try and chase down and that we will continue to pursue. Um, you'll know that w that one that has been canvassed more broadly has been the idea of whether or not it was just a burning ember that existed in the community that now essentially um, has has really been diminished as a potential because the form, this the strain that we have at the moment is not something that we saw originally in New Zealand. Um, of course, the cases at the moment are still congregating around uh, one work site that was a, a cool store. Um, there's a number of theories that exist, um, but not a lot of research that tells us uh, at this point um, whether or not surfaces are in play or whether or not there was a connection through that supply chain as yet. We continue to pursue that, but we may not know. And so what I would prepare everyone for we do not necessarily need to answer that question in order to contain uh, and deal with this cluster effectively. In fact, overseas, that has been the case on many occasions, and in fact, in New Zealand, we've had those circumstances too. Um, just that update from the, the 1 p.m. press conference when you were, we weren't certain of the, the link with that um, one case that's in Auckland Hospital. You're now saying that it's likely linked to the cluster. Can you um, elaborate on that and how, how and what you know? Uh, yes, what I can add is that um, there is a connection between where that person's workplace is and the Americold um, workplace, and it seems very likely that, that we will be able to um, connect that case back to this existing cluster, but it's still not yet um, confirmed. Mm. Prime Minister, what does, what does today's decision mean for the timing of the election? Uh, Today, the most important focus for Cabinet, and indeed for myself, on the advice of the Director-General, was what we do with alert levels. Um, and so that's not a decision that um, I have taken at this stage, but obviously we have another 48 hours, and so I'll take that time and make sure that you um, you hear from me further on that in the interim. Pushing it out 12 hours means that the election on September 19th can no longer happen, given the campaign. Sorry, what was your rationale? Sorry? Ah, days, sorry, yeah. Look, again, the focus here has been making this decision. Uh, I will make sure that we have extra detail on the question of the election, but the focus in the immediate point here has been uh, making sure that we make a decision over uh, uh, what's happening for Auckland and the rest of New Zealand. One point I would make is that, keep in mind, and I, I just add this for the benefit of the Electoral Commission, not to predetermine anything with this statement, but the Electoral Commission has done planning around offering an election within a level, a, a level two scenario. I only say that to just remind people that they are taking precautions as well. I want people to be assured that they are thinking about the circumstances for New Zealand, whatever they may be in the future. The so, of, in the dissolution of Parliament then, so that is Monday? something you will make a decision on before Friday right. morning? Of course, yes, yes. So, so what happens to... What happens to um, the rest of the country when Auckland moves to level two? Does the rest of the country stay at level two? We'll make, an assess we'll make an assessment at that time. So every time we reassess Auckland settings, we'll make an assessment around the rest of New Zealand as well. Don Derek. Are you firm on that um, August 26th date? Or have you given yourself some wriggle room with the review on the 20, on August 21? If the testing, yeah. mass testing showed you know, that the outbreak yeah. appeared to be contained, yeah. might we move the settings? Yeah, it's a review. And so we are giving ourselves that opportunity. We did want, however, to give people a bit of certainty around the planning. We foresee at this stage, we foresee no reason why it will be any longer um, than midnight Wednesday the 26th of August, but we will be reviewing in seven days' time. Did you discuss making masks mandatory? Uh, 
no, no. We've had we've had good discussion around that. Uh, uh, everyone was uh, continuing to be of the view that we need to continue to encourage their use, make sure there's provision for their use, uh, and we'll keep that under advisement. But at this stage, people were satisfied with that decision. Did you decide not to move Tokoroa into a higher alert level, given the two cases there? Yeah. At this stage, of course, those cases are very clearly and directly linked to the travel and socialising of one identified case. They're being identified through contact tracing. They were proactively, proactively tested through that process and then isolated and quarantined. So that has actually been all in keeping with our plan uh, as a cases emerge or if we have an outbreak. Um, the reason we, we've treated that differently to Auckland, of course, Auckland is the source. It's where we're predominantly seeing the infection. It is where we're primarily still determining the perimeter of the cluster. Um, but Director-General. Yes. Can I make an additional comment on that? One of the things that's really encouraging uh, in this outbreak is not just the testing that is happening, but how, uh, how early on in their symptoms people are coming forward to be tested. So the, the, the cases in Tokoro came forward to be tested uh, on Tuesday, symptomatic, even though their exposure had just been on the weekend. And so this is a really critical measure for our success in being able to rapidly identify cases, isolate them, and then contact trace. And as I said at one o'clock, uh, we already know that of the s many hundreds of people we have followed up as contacts, over, we've got had over 83% of them uh, contacted and isolated within that 48 hour period, which is great. Yeah. Oh, no, so no, don't, no, don't, don't, don't we have to identify the source of this in order to have confidence that we won't see a repeat? No, not necessarily. What also gives us confidence is the, the wide range of testing, and you will see here the fact that we've had 30,000 tests and are still identifying cases that are all traceable and connected to this cluster. So that's one thing that gives us confidence. Time gives us that additional confidence because if there were additional cases, we would, we would start to see those arise as well. And thirdly, our own experience. We have had clusters before where we haven't always been able to identify the source and indeed overseas you see in the likes of, from memory, Dr. Bluefield Germany, I believe, has had clusters they've managed and contained where they haven't always been able to identify the source. It, it is still preferable and we will continue all of the investigatory work to try and determine that, but it may be the case that we don't and that wouldn't be a reason not to lower our alert level. So yeah. What are the latest modelling numbers you have? Well, actually the, the most recent conversation I've had with those who have been talking to our modellers is that clusters aren't, or, aren't actually uh, a, a, an easy thing or a st something you can successfully model because everything is unique to that cluster. It's when you have wider outbreaks and multiple clusters that the modeling is more accurate. So the caution I've been given is that modeling is unlikely to be able to predict what we would see here. We can rely, however, on past cl clusters just to get a sense of how they tend to behave in the scale of them. And we have seen in New Zealand clusters that can get up to the 80, 100 mark. Is that, is that a fair reflection, Dr. Bloomfield? The election question. Um, yes. Um, one of the options, obviously, is about you have available to you is just to leave it to the Electoral Commission because yep. they have the powers to defer. Would that be a prudent course of action given that would take the politics out of yeah. the Yeah, look, and look, again, as I say, the most important, and I think it's not an unfair statement, the most important thing for Cabinet and indeed. Um, myself today, because that is where the decision over the election date at the moment falls. You're right to say that down the track it would fall to the Electoral Commission. At the moment, my focus was simply on making sure that our resurgence plan was in place, that we're doing everything that we need and we have the settings in the right place. I've, I've got another 48 hours, I'm going to use it, and I'll come back on the question of the election. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. Who are you bringing to your, um, into your or confidence? Who will you consult with over the election date? Oh, well, ultimately, it's something that falls on my shoulders. Um, I am aware, though, of the Electoral Commission's view um, uh, and all of the issues they have to factor in. It's one of the reasons I did highlight that they have done preparatory work around the different settings New Zealand might be in. Um, but I, I did make sure that I was briefed by them in that regard um, yesterday afternoon so that I can factor all of that in my thinking. Um, Brett? Just in terms of the difficulty with the modelling, but yes. do you then have milestones go that you can look at in terms of working out whether this particular cluster is coming under control where yep. you feel comfortable about dropping down the levels. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll let Dr Bloomfield because he has to use that information to give advice to us. Yeah, so I think the critical thing is um, 
the pattern of the spread that we see over the next, um, or the, and the cases we see over the next uh, seven to 12 days, um, and the, the, the sort of settings they are occurring in. So partly it's about the number, uh, and also whether there is uh, geographical containment and or whether those cases and or their close contacts have been in settings where there could have been further spread like churches or schools and so on. We've seen that already. So again, it's looking at the pattern, geographical and those sorts of settings, the number of cases, the links between them, and uh, and also we'll, we'll also be looking for the rate of, of growth. We're, we're growing quite quickly at the moment. We'll want to see that level off. Yeah. One of the things we yeah. have discussed, though, is that don't expect that we have to see, for instance, zero cases at all in order to move levels. It is something that we've discussed. Of course, our regime has to be built for us to be able to exist in a level two environment with the management of cases. What we will be looking for, though, is just to, to really have a sense that we've got what, we, what I'm calling the perimeter of the, of, um, uh, of the cluster under control. Um, I'll come to Jackson. Prime Minister, it's obviously still early days, but all of the cases except the one still under investigation can be linked to yes. the same cluster. Have yep. we dodged a bullet here? It is heartening to see at this stage that linkage between all of those cases. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We've always um, taken a precautionary approach because if you make a wrong move uh, with COVID, we can we can see very easily um, the, the long-term impact of that, and particularly in terms of how long as a consequence of the wrong move you can spend with restrictions. Uh, and, and Australia, you know, has has demonstrated that to us. So we are looking at the experience of others and making our decisions. The situation in Melbourne playing in influencing your decision to, to go hard very early. We're evidence-based. And so you would expect us to look overseas at what other experiences have demonstrated, um, the likes of Hong Kong or the likes of Australia, where they have taken a little bit more time um, and uh, existed um, with a more open environment while they've determined a perimeter of an outbreak. Our view is it's better to assess that with restrictions in place so ultimately you can get back to freedom faster. That's our approach. Um, 30,000 um, tests. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, of the 30,000 tests, what portion were done in Auckland? I, forgive me, I don't have a breakdown with me here. I do know that we have that, though, by DHB. We can provide that. I wouldn't be surprised yeah, look, if it's it, provided publicly. Yeah, my, my understanding, it's about half of them. So at least 50%. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. After the 1pm update, were you provided uh, details of further testing results, or are you still relying We're on We're sticking to the 1pm. Sticking to the 1pm. Further there's, positive I would say that there's, again, uh, the pattern that we're describing here has not changed. On the wedge... So the pattern of the cluster has not changed. So yeah. on, on the move to the level four, what are the criteria or the thresholds we should watch for if... Um, yeah, we need to go. A good question. N nothing, obviously, that we're seeing here. But you'll remember that the criteria for level four is, you know, multiple outbreaks, um, uh, multiple uh, uh, scenes of community transmission, um, just a much larger scale than what we we're dealing with here. Yeah. Just on the extension, does this set a precedent? So. Oh. oh. <laughs> um, just on the extension. Just on. The, just on the extension of the wage subsidy scheme. Have you got any indication about how much extra that's going to cost? Um, I, I don't want to steal the um, thunder of the Minister of Finance, who will take the podium immediately after we've completed questions. But um, remember, we do have an underspend currently for the second extension. Uh, we had an estimate that it would be roughly 2.6 to 3.9 billion. Uh, in terms of the drawdown on that, it's actually come in closer to two. So there is already an appropriation that we can draw on for a wage subsidy extension. Yeah. With, uh, with a third of the population now in much more severe restrictions for a much longer time, could New Zealand still consider itself a team of five million? Yes. You know, not everyone in a team is on the field at the same time. And, you know, some of us currently are on the sidelines really rooting for those who are experiencing those, um, uh, th that level of restriction. Um, and that's why I just ask the rest of the team to, to be really supportive, um, just to be mindful of that. If you know people in Auckland, particularly if you know people who are isolated, do reach out to them. Level three is not the same as level four, though. We have a much higher rate of economic activity, much more people who are, s are safely in the workplace. But that doesn't mean that there won't be people experiencing loneliness, anxiety and hardship. So we do need to make sure we look after each other. Does, does this set a precedent here so that we can you know, understand how future decisions will be made? So if like four cases show up in Dunedin next week, 
could they anticipate two weeks of level three? No, not, not necessarily. And of course, it, we still apply to these decisions the framework for um, our levels, and they have a description over under what circumstances we would move either regions or the country. And so again, um, what's happened in the Waikato fits with level two. We know that they're linked, they're contained, um, they're isolated. It's a similar scenario, a cluster, you know, yeah. what appears to be the, an outbreak, an unknown outbreak, at the beginning of, a, of another cluster in Dunedin in a week's time. Should they expect to be yeah. level three immediately? Again. Very much depending on the scenario, because at the moment what we have is we don't have the beginning of the chain, which creates much more uncertainty. If you have the beginning of the change, even that changes some of the decision making. So that's why when we developed our resurgence plan, it was based on a range of different scenarios because it ultimately will come down to what you're experiencing, where the chain begins, and how wide and connected the clusters are. But yeah, covers it. Satisfied with the rigor of uh, restrictions on movement outside of Auckland, there have been reports of non insignificant not insignificant amounts of people flying into places like Christchurch and yeah. Queenstown. Might you, the government, sort of intervene and, and sort of so add one of, you're that one of the things that we did last time uh, was we did allow enough time for people to relocate. And so that sometimes took a little bit longer than when the orders came in. What we're going to do over the weekend is look uh, at the way that this is operating at our, at our, um, uh, our road checks. And we'll also have a look at the way aviation is working. I'm picking up on some of the anecdote that we're hearing, so we will reflect on whether or not we need to look again at the way we're operating that at the, at the aviation border. Just on that, are you, do you have any evidence yet in terms of whether those passenger flows are tracking with what you would expect for purely residential movements, people returning? Well, we know that from within Auckland, it's, it's actually lower than it was last time we were in level three. So that gives us something about the intra Auckland regional travel. I don't have the data around between regions, but it is something we'll look at and we are over the weekend reviewing some of that. Just mindful of the time, I'll take a couple more questions and then hand over to the Minister of Finance. Jenna. Mike can go to the Minister of Finance. It's okay. okay, great. Are you happy with today's decision? How did it stack up with the advice that you gave Cabinet this afternoon? Oh, well, as I said earlier, it, it follows very closely the advice we gave, actually. And um, uh, I should say that whilst the advice is under my name, it's not mine alone. I uh, had a, com a conversation this morning with my Chief Science Advisor, Dr Ian Town, Dr Caroline McElnay, the Director of Public Health, and they had worked with our team. We were in constant dialogue with the Public Health Unit in Auckland, uh, meetings with them at least twice, if not three times a day. So it's the full a full range of advice from a, a lot of good people. Um, the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor has been actively involved in the discussions as well. So I think there was a, a very strong uh, consensus on what our public health advice was, and that's very much informed the Cabinet decision. Then it's yes, our job as a Cabinet to balance that against the, the economic impact on the Auckland region and the rest of New Zealand as well. And that's what Cabinet's job is to then weigh up those, those two decisions. But our view is a strong health response is the best thing we can do for the economy. Benedict. So was it was it Benedict. unanimous at the cabinet table today? Yes, Benedict. What was your view on the um, interview that Winston Peters gave last night for um, Australian television? And you will have already heard me speak um, to what the evidence is telling us. Uh, and the evidence is telling us at the moment that none of the genome testing that's been carried out to date and that is available to us of those cases we've had in our managed isolation can currently be linked back to the cases we have. And so that's the evidence that we have, and so that is what I'll be basing all of our decisions and assumptions around. Bloomfield, is there any health advice that Cabinet has decided not to follow? Uh, you mean today? <laughs> uh, uh, no. No. I don't think there's many generally, actually. I think that we're reasonably responsive. <laughs> All right, do you know, last question. Was it irresponsible for a cabinet minister to put information into the public that hadn't been provided by an official source? I believe that he was reflecting um, uh, information passed to him from a journalist, so perhaps we could ask the question equally on that side as well. Um, I'm going to hand over going to hand over to um, last question, Jackson. I'll be generous. Did the Deputy Prime Minister apologise to you? Oh, look, I haven't asked him to, nor would I expect him to. He's free, he is free to give his own interviews. Um, you can expect that I will continue to just reflect back what the evidence is showing. That is what we rely on to determine uh, uh, where the source of this is. And as I've said, although we haven't yet found that source, we will continue looking very, very hard, despite the lack of a current link. 
I'll be asking the Minister of Finance, Grant Robertson, to take the podium, and uh, we will have another update tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Uh, kia ora, uh, nami nui nui. Kia koutou koutou. Uh, as the Prime Minister has indicated, today we have made an in principle decision to extend the wage subsidy to cover the period for the, of the current Level 3 restrictions. I just want to talk about some of our thinking uh, behind making the extension to the wage subsidy nationwide. Auckland represents a significant part of the New Zealand economy, nearly 40% of GDP. As a result of that, and the Auckland economy's connections with the rest of New Zealand, it is clear that a Level 3 situation in Auckland will have impacts on the rest of New Zealand. That's not only in terms of business and trade activity being connected throughout New Zealand, but also the fact that we are asking Aucklanders to stay home and the impact that will have on tourism elsewhere in New Zealand. We are already hearing reports of cancelled bookings and that is having an impact on regional economies throughout New Zealand. A lot of businesses outside of Auckland rely on customers from Auckland. So making the wage subsidy nationwide is also a recognition of that and the alert level two settings which have an impact on hospitality and retail businesses in other parts of the country. And we want to make sure we're helping to cushion the blow for these businesses as well. I can also confirm today that we are looking to changes to other existing schemes as part of our plan to support businesses through this outbreak. In particular, Cabinet has also agreed in principle that we will make changes to the criteria for the COVID leave scheme to improve access to it. We want to make sure that anybody who has been asked to stay home because they are required to self-isolate or because they are immunocompromised has the confidence to do so and they know that they will be looked after regardless of where they work. We are doing this in part to emphasise the importance of getting tested and then self-isolating if you test positive. We do not want people to be afraid to get tested because they think their livelihoods or income or job may be at risk. This is about having the right settings for this situation. We've already shown that we can support, get the support to businesses quickly to help cash flow and confidence, and this will be the same this time around. Details, including the specific criteria and audit activities for this, will be announced on Monday. Our expectation is that access to the scheme will be very similar to previous criteria. The Ministry of Social Development have indicated that they will be able to implement the new wage subsidy scheme within five days. It is also very important to note that applications for the current wage subsidy extension are still open and expire on the 1st of September. I encourage all businesses to check if they are eligible, even if they thought they previously were not. Outbreaks like this are exactly why the government prudently held back money in the COVID fund to support the economy in the event of a further rainy day. We also have money remaining in the wage subsidy scheme and leave support scheme allocations that will be able to help meet the costs of this scheme. We will announce the details of an extension to the mortgage deferral scheme as well. Um, that was already announced in principle by the Reserve Bank Governor. The final details will be operationalised and we'll be able to put them out into the public arena on Monday as well. This is all part of our plan to continue to help cushion the blow for businesses and households as we fight the virus. Gina. Looking at, particularly with the leave scheme, is one of the things that you are looking at abolishing that criteria for the 30% loss in revenue for the business? That is one of the issues that we will be considering. Obviously, when we bought the scheme in, in March, we were looking at a situation where we did want to ensure that those who uh, felt, you know, who were, had to isolate or had the virus were able to stay home. Some businesses at that time were able to absorb those costs. We've also got a situation now where many New Zealanders have used their sick leave entitlements. And so that is one of the things that we are looking at is whether or not we remove that requirement. What's really important for us is that every New Zealander has the confidence to be tested and to know that if in the event that they do test positive, they will be supported. We don't want any compromise on that, and so clearly we need to look at that criteria. Well, so the, 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 criteria the criteria, um, you've said it's going to be similar to the past scheme, the wage subsidy in particular, there was the difference in the, in the first round and the second round of 30 or 40%.
are you leaning towards either of those? Uh, that's exactly the discussion that will take place over the weekend. Um, what we need to do is make sure that we're reflecting the experience that, that businesses are having, uh, and we'll take a little bit of time over the weekend to decide on that. Do you expect the scheme to, the extension of the scheme to cost? Well, one of the issues here is the availability of the, wage, the existing wage subsidy extension. So because that's actually available for application until the 1st of September, the number of people who actually will now take that up will dictate a little bit of the total cost. Uh, the early estimates, um, depending on the question that Jenna just asked, is that this extension would come in a, under a billion dollars. Well, when you're talking about the this new wage subsidy, uh, and you say it will um, apply for the duration of Level 3, so we're talking about a, two, a very short two-week wage subsidy. Well, that, obviously, that's the plan that we have at this time, yes, but we, what we want to be able to do is set up a scheme that enables us to be flexible and adaptable the, 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 did you consider the limiting program? the extension to just businesses in Auckland, for example, rather than nationwide? Yeah, look, certainly we considered that idea. The issue we've got is that those regional boundaries don't really work when you start to deeply analyse them. For example, you can even have businesses that are registered in Auckland but actually do a lot of their activity outside and vice versa. Um, we were particularly conscious of those businesses outside of Auckland that supply into Auckland and the impact that it would have on them. So. Administratively, it also would have made it a lot slower uh, to be able to get out the door. Minister, um, the tourism, hotel, um, hospitality sectors have said they need something special there at the end of the road. What's your thoughts on that? Well, obviously, we've already allocated specific funding for the tourism sector, and we've, we've put out the $400 million there. Um, more than 120 strategic tourism businesses have um, received the benefit of that. Obviously, this extension now will support our retail and hospitality. Uh, we continue to look at sectors and see what else we can do, but obviously, in the immediate term, this will be available to all of those businesses. Jenna. Uh, the decision to only have it open for the two weeks, is that based on how quickly our economy bounced back after the first lockdown? It's based on the impact of level three. And it's based on, as the Prime Minister said, taking you down to around 80% of activity and that flow on. Uh, so it's based on that change. It is, and I take the point that you're making, which is that businesses had really felt good that they'd come back better. Uh, a lot of them had really got themselves just up and running again. And there is a, a bit of a, a blow that's been taken by this. So part of this is saying, look, we didn't, we recognise that. We want to give you some port, support through this period. Um, obviously, as I said, we'll continue to look at future decisions, but this is the one that's right for this particular set of restrictions. Um, uh, businesses were crying out for help during lockdown for rent assistance and utilities that largely wasn't addressed by the government. What's, we've got two weeks in Auckland where they're going to have these issues again. Is there any thought for future changes or any assistance with these costs? One of the things we are doing is taking a look at all of the support schemes that are currently available. And one of those, for example, is the Small Business Cash Flow Loan Scheme, which is where a lot of the businesses have been able to meet their other costs beyond wages through rent and insurance and so on. So we're taking another look at that scheme and all of the support schemes to see whether or not they can be tweaked. The decision that Cabinet took today was about the wage subsidy scheme and the leave support scheme. The economy is more like an, an oven, you know, it takes a while to have a light bulb, it takes a while to sort of heat up and turn on. Is a two week wage subsidy going to be enough in that respect? Because you are turning the economy off and off and again, and it's, you know, this will, the economic effects of that are going to last a lot longer than two weeks in level three. Yeah, obviously there have been um, support schemes in place already, so people have bought up, built up a certain reservoir. Um, also, I think the fact that we did come back quicker that actually most businesses were finding that they were generating more revenue than they thought they would, all gives me the confidence that we can do the scheme this way. But I want to be clear, there is flexibility built into this that should we need to, we can add further time to it. Cost in Auckland is, is obviously commercial rent, and that is an area where there have been a lot of businesses saying that the government's solution to that isn't actually strong enough, and that was largely a result of issues within the Cabinet. Would you ever consider re-looking at that? 
as I said in the answer to the previous question, we're taking a look at all of the support that we give at the moment to businesses uh, to make sure it's fit for purpose for the situation. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, I'm, I want to look at the, con the schemes that we've got, such as the small business cash flow loan scheme, and obviously we can come back on that. But what we, th I'll just finish, what we thought was very important today was to be able to give the confidence around the wage subsidy scheme, also the leave support scheme. We will and we are continuing to monitor the schemes we've got. Uh, the Prime Minister mentioned the Cabinet got economic advice um, on the economic effects against the health effects, and there's been some cost-benefit analysis to the Treasury saying that previous extensions were actually costly, uh, if you take into account the qualies. Um, so what advice did you get about this extension, the actual cost-benefit analysis? Well, I think the advice we got was, and the Prime Minister has already suggested it, I've seen a variety of uh, uh, economists talking about the hit on Auckland being somewhere between well, if you 400 million through to um, up to 600 or 700 million dollars. So we were very clear that this was a significant impact. What I don't think that takes into account, however, is that flow on impact to other parts of New Zealand as well. So clearly for us, it was important both for confidence reasons, but also for those those pure economic reasons to be able to do this. When it comes to the, the biggest studies around the comparisons, the qualities as you call them, or, or the, the range of comparisons that I've seen around investments in, in health versus the economy, I just reiterate what the Prime Minister has said. We have never wavered from the view that the best economic response was a strong public health response, and we continue to stand by that. Ben? On any analysis, or is it just this is an underlying, this is what we It's do. both a principle, and there I can recall standing on this podium talking about some of the historical evidence going back to the 1918 flu epidemic of that being true, but I also think that was borne out in the 100 and odd days that we had um, without community transmission when we moved to level uh, one that we did do well uh, relative to the rest of the world. I'll just take a couple more, Ben. I understand you're not the decision maker around the election date, but you're certainly a politician. So I wouldn't mind asking you whether you think an election on September 19 is fair to the other parties, given the pulpit you, you stand at. The election date is entirely the decision of the Prime Minister. One more. Be no, fair I, to I'm, campaign I'm not going to comment. Ben, I'm not going to comment further on it. The Prime Minister is the person who makes that call. In April, the Reserve Bank said that under level three, the economy would operate at a 70% capacity. Now you're saying the modeling is based off 80%. Is there some risk that that 80% figure is based off pent up demand coming out of level four? Uh, no, that's because that was the, the Treasury and the Reserve Bank always had slightly different definitions of what the activity at level three would look like. So we're using the Treasury's uh, numbers here. That's the only reason for that. Has it changed over time, that expectation of economic? Uh, well, we've got a little bit of experience of what happened under Level 4 and Level 3, but it hasn't. The, those numbers and percentages have not changed particularly. Um, we do have to remember, and it is very important, the Prime Minister made this point as well, that under Level 3, businesses can operate as long as it's safe to do so. And so there is, as you know, a lot of economic activity in Auckland. Um, Mayor Goff keeps undertaking interviews with people working on construction sites outside his window. So there are a lot of things happening. Um, that's good as long as they continue to happen safely. So, um, Mayor Goff has been calling for support for Auckland Council. Did you consider that today and can the Council expect anything? Uh, no, we didn't consider that today. He's, um, I heard him on the radio this morning and, and he's um, talked to me about uh, what Auckland Council is going through, but that wasn't a matter that we considered today. I've actually got some radio interviews, so I've got to go off. Bernard. Um, what advice have you got on how long the logistics system in the country can handle this separation of lockdown? Mm -hmm. So far, um, I think it's been operating relatively well. Um, obviously, there are one or two concerns people have about the fact that they might need to be stopped at a checkpoint or so on while, um, while goods are, are being delivered. But so far, so good. But that is definitely one of the issues we continue to monitor. Um, clearly, because Auckland is Auckland, there is freight that is going to need to leave uh, the city and go into the city. Uh, and we're keeping a very close eye on it. But to this point, um, we haven't had any specific concerns raised with us. Thanks, everyone.